Hi students, this lecture is on definite integrals. We did say that integrals help us to calculate the areas of figures, volumes of solids, pressure exerted by fluids on the walls of containers and so on. But indefinite integrals do not give a particular value of any of these. Rather, in most of the cases, we need a definite value. And for that, definite integrals come into play. So in this lecture, we will understand geometrical interpretation of definite integrals, their properties, and will understand the different techniques to solve them by solving IIT problems. I hope you got the clear indication that this lecture is an important part of JE syllabus. So let's begin. So let us try to understand what are definite integrals. Now if we say that i is equal to the integral of f of x, then we know that this would be equal to some function of x. Let us say that this is equal to capital F of x plus c, your c is the constant of integration. Now we know that for different values of c, we would get different values of i. So as such, we get a family of curves. So if we put c equal to 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on, we would get different values of i. So that is actually the reason why this is known as indefinite integration. Because for different values of c, we get different values of i. But on the contrary, definite integral has a unique value. So the basic difference between indefinite integration and definite integration is that indefinite does not give us a unique value of i, whereas definite integration gives us a unique value of i. Now any definite integral is denoted by integral of fx dx from a to b. Your a is called as the lower limit and b is called as the upper limit. So definite integration takes place over an interval. So here we say that a is the lower limit and b is the upper limit to which the integration process takes place. Now if i is equal to integral of fx from a to b then this would be equal to capital F of x plus c from a to b. So what we do is we substitute the value of x equal to b in this expression minus we substitute the value of a in this expression so that i would be equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a. So what we do is we first try to find out the indefinite integral of fx and then we substitute the values x equal to b and x equal to a and subtract them. So we can say that this is the difference in values of i for two different values of x. Thus we can say that i is nothing but the difference in values of i for two different values of x which are x equal to b and x equal to a. Your a is the lower limit and b is called as the upper limit. Now we have seen what is definite integral. But what does it actually physically represent? What does definite integral denote? So let's try to explore this. Let us say that i is equal to integral of fx dx from a to b. This is equal to the area of a, b, c, d, a. That is a, b, c, d, a. Let us say that this is the curve phi equal to f of x. Now this is actually equal to the area between the curve, the line x equal to a, the line x equal to b and the x axis. So physically integral fx dx from a to b denotes the area between the curve, between the lines x equal to a, the line x equal to b and the x axis. So now how to calculate this area? What we do is we divide this entire interval from a to b into n equal sub intervals. Let us say that this is x equal to x0, x1, x2 and so on. Now this interval is of uniform length. Let us say that this is equal to h. Now x0 would be equal to a, x1 would be equal to a plus h, x2 would be equal to a plus 2h and so on. So any rth term would be equal to a plus r times h. And finally we know that xn would be equal to a plus n times h and this is equal to b. So we get n equal to b minus a by h. So your n is equal to b minus a divided by h. So what we have done here is we have divided this entire area into strips. So this is the area of one strip, this is the area of other strip and so on. 
So when we add the area of all these strips, we would get the area of the curve between the lines x equal to a, x equal to b and the x axis. Now if n tends to infinity, then h would tend to 0. As we know that n is equal to p minus a by h. So when n would tend to infinity, h would tend to 0. Now if we add the areas of all these subregions, we get the area of a, b, c, d. Let us look at this portion. Area of P, Q, R, S, this brown portion, is less than this entire portion, this entire portion, and which is less than this rectangle P, Q, T, U. So we see that this rectangle P, Q, R, S is less than area P, Q, T, S, and which is equal to the area between the curve, the x axis, the point P, and point Q. And which is actually less than this entire rectangle that is P Q T U P. So we get this identity. So let us say that S N denotes the area of such rectangles P Q R S. Capital S N denotes the area of such rectangles P Q T U. So S N would be equal to the area of this rectangle plus the area of this rectangle and so on up to the area of this rectangle. Now this length is nothing but equal to h. This is f of xr minus 1. So this area would be equal to the area of rectangle which is h times f of x of r minus 1. So when we take all these rectangles we get this as h and this as f of x naught. So the area of this rectangle would be equal to h times f of x naught. Similarly, the area of this rectangle would be equal to h times f of x1 and so on up to h times f of xn minus 1. Thus, the area of these rectangles is equal to sn and which is equal to h times f of x naught plus h times f of x1 and so on up to h times f of xn minus 1. Thus, we can write it as equal to h times summation of f of x r where we see that r varies from 0 to n minus 1. Thus, s n is equal to h times summation of f of x r where r varies from 0 to n minus 1. Now similarly, let's try to calculate the area of this big rectangle p q t u. Now this is equal to h times f of x r because the length of this is f of xr. Thus, we see that if we add the areas of such rectangles, then we get sn equal to h times f of x1 plus f of x2 and so on up to f of xn. Thus, sn is equal to h times summation of f of r where r varies from 1 to n. Thus, we see that small sn would be less than area of a, b, c, d, a which is the area of the curve between x axis x equal to a and x equal to b and this would be less than capital S n. Now what if n tends to infinity? Now we see that when n tends to infinity all these strips will become very close to each other and thus they will become very narrow. So when n tends to infinity we will see that S n would be equal to capital S n and that would be equal to the area of a b c d. So when n tends to infinity, then this relation holds. That is, small sn would be equal to capital Sn and that would be equal to the area of A, B, C, D, A. So we can say that the area of fx dx from A to B, which is actually the area of A, B, C, D, A, this would be equal to limit of h times f of A plus f of A plus h plus so on up to f of a plus h times n minus 1. Your h tends to 0. Why? Because we see that n tends to infinity. Now what we do is we substitute the value of h. Here we know that h is equal to b minus a by n. So we substitute this value here to get integral of fx dx from a to b is equal to b minus a into limit of 1 by n into f of a plus f of a plus h and so on up to 
f of a plus n minus 1 into h. Here, h is equal to b minus a by n and when n tends to infinity, we get h tends to 0. Thus, this integral is nothing but equal to the limit of sum, sum of such strips. So, so that is why we express definite integral as limit of sum. So based on the above concept, let's try to solve an example. Find the value of integral of e to the power of 2x from 0 to 1. So we have to find the value of integral e to the power of 2x from 0 to 1. Now let us say that i is equal to the integral e to the power of 2x from 0 to 1. Now we would use definite integral as limit of sum. i would be equal to limit of 1 by n into f of a plus f of a plus h plus f of a plus 2h and so on up to f of a plus n minus 1 into h. Your n tends to infinity. Now we also know that h is equal to b minus a by n. Here the value of b is equal to 1 and the value of a is equal to 0. So h would be equal to 1 minus 0 by n and that was equal to 1 by n. Thus h is equal to 1 by n. Now fx is equal to e to the power of 2x. So i would be equal to limit of 1 by n into f of 0 plus f of 0 plus 1 by n plus f of 0 plus 2 by n and so on up to f of 0 plus n minus 1 by n. Here we put the value of h equal to 1 by n in this expression and the value of a equal to 0 in this expression. Now we get i equal to limit of 1 by n into f of 0 is nothing but equal to 1. f of 0 plus 1 by n would be equal to e to the power of 2 by n plus f of 0 plus 2 by n would be equal to e to the power of 4 by n and so on we get this expression as e to the power of 2 times n minus 1 by n. Now we see that these terms are in JP. Now why because we see that these terms have a common ratio and that is equal to e to the power of 2 by n. Now we write i equal to limit of 1 by n into e to the power of 2n by n minus 1 divided by e to the power of 2 by n minus 1. Here again n tends to infinity. Now this is equal to e square minus 1 and we write this expression as this way e to the power of 2 by n minus 1 divided by 2 by n. Now when we take the limit of this expression we get i equal to e square minus 1. How we get this expression? We use the limit of this expression limit of e to the power of h minus 1 divided by h when h tends to 0. We convert it to this form and we get this i equal to e square minus 1. That's the value of i which is integral of e to the power of 2x from 0 to 1 is equal to e square minus 1.